Welcome to episode 11 of the Hunt Backcountry podcast, presented by Exo Mountain Gear. First things first, we want to give away some more Exo swag. So we picked an iTunes review from T. Clowery, left us some good feedback. We really appreciate it. If you want to be entered into a weekly giveaway for Exo swag, just leave us a review on iTunes or send us your feedback to podcast at exomountaingear.com. You know, we're 10 episodes in, now 11 with this one. And we're really excited about where this podcast is going, really excited about the feedback you've given us. But to make this podcast better, it really depends on you guys. What do you want to hear? Who do you want to hear from? That's what we want to know. So be sure and leave us your feedback. Also wanted to let you guys that we're now going to begin publishing show notes for each episode. So as we interview more and more guests, talk about different topics, um, certain resources, links, and interesting facts come up during the show. We want to get those to you guys at a place that's easy to find. So what we're going to do is for every show, we're going to take the show number, in this case 11, and if you would just go to exomountaingear.com forward slash 11, you'll be able to find all the show notes for this episode, and we're going to keep doing that for all the future episodes. Let us know if that's helpful and how we can make it better for you guys. On tonight's episode, we talk with Joseph Skinner of Vale Camo. Now chances are you might not have heard of Joseph or of Vale, But there's even a better chance that you have seen his work, or maybe even worn it, without knowing it. Joseph worked with First Light to develop First Light's new proprietary camouflage pattern, Fusion. They worked on it for well over a year, all kinds of research and science behind the pattern to make it not only look good to you, the hunter, but more importantly, be effective. So we talk about not just Fusion in this episode, but in general, what makes camouflage effective, What are the different types of camouflages? How does human concealment differ from animal concealment? And all kinds of interesting topics. So if you want to know know more about camouflage, what makes it actually work, and how it can help you be a better hunter, this is a great episode to check out. One thing to make you guys aware of, Joseph was just coming off of uh, building a special pattern, actually, for some foreign special forces, and had IR, infrared on the brain, We started talking about UV, ultraviolet, with animal vision, but we mistakenly used the term IR at first. So you'll hear it. We get into a discussion about UV, but actually mention IR. Um, So just wanted to throw that out there, that when we start to talk about IR, we're actually talking about UV and animal vision. And uh, we correct ourselves later, but just to clear up any confusion when we head down that path, that's what was going on there. So... Hope you enjoy this episode with Joseph, and thanks as always for listening. Be sure and send us your feedback. All right, well, Joe, welcome to the Hunt Back Country Podcast. Yeah, great. Nice to be here. Yeah, and Steve, you're on the line. How you doing, bud? Ah, uh, good, man. Just uh, working away. Yeah. <laughs> well, Joe, we're super excited to have you and really excited to pick your brain um, <laughs> just personally, selfishly. You know, it's one of those things with you being a uh, developer of camouflage patterns. It's like there's so much that goes into it that I'm sure that most of us are unaware. Um, and I think there's a there's big... There's a lot, yeah. Yeah, I think there's a big discrepancy of what looks cool to the human eye and what might look cool on the rack versus what's actually effective. And so that's what, you know, we want to learn tonight is what's effective and why is it effective. So absolutely. Yeah. So first things first, how, how the heck did you get involved and come to be where you're at now? What's your background? Oh man, it's, it's kind of a funny story. Um, I was in the army for six years, uh, just under six years. And uh, I was wearing their, uh, the pattern they're phasing out now called UCP, and um, is that, I hated it. Is that one of the <laughs> digitals? Or? Yeah, it's, the, it's kind of that greenish-gray digital pattern. Yeah. And uh, uh, a lot of people really, really disliked the pattern, and uh, I wasn't an exception. Um, I, uh, I heard a lot of stories uh, and, you know, first-hand accounts from friends that had actually been you know, in theater and their, their situation was compromised because, you know, they're, they were given away, you know, yeah. by, it was, they're just too easy to spot is, is a huge problem. And, uh, so, uh, 
I kind of started to get obsessive compulsive about camo. I've always thought it was cool, um, but I never really knew what went into it, why certain patterns were good, why others weren't good. And uh, I dug into it a lot and devoted like, I don't know, the better part of a year, year and a half, just initially trying to wrap my head around what makes camo work yeah. and, you know, what, what makes it work in the natural world, what makes it work you know, uh, or not work in the digital pattern that's, you know, being applied to, to, to garments and, you know, given to soldiers, given to hunters, you know, whatever it may be. Yeah. And, uh, that's kind of how I got into it. Yeah. That's pretty awesome. So, you know, coming from like, from a hunting perspective, from sort of concealing humans from other humans, I'm assuming it was kind of a leap to then get in the hunting side of things and start to learn about animal vision. Um, you know, it's, I actually, I actually jumped into that kind of around the same time. I started really getting interested in the outdoors and hunting and, and really kind of taking my own food into my own hands per se. And, uh, I, uh, I took a look at the camel market and I, it also kind of made me equally frustrated because there's a, it's all over the map. Yeah. And there's lots and lots of marketing dollars trying to trying to to push you in one direction or the other. And um, there's not a whole lot of difference between a lot of the camos that are out there, unfortunately, in terms of effective and uh, effectiveness. But, uh, yeah, I I started digging into re- research papers, uh, published papers about um, deer vision um, and you, the way that eyes and the brain perceive focal uh, focal stuff right in front of you. And then, you know, the, uh, periphery around, you know, what different animals, what they see, how wide their, their vision is. Are they colorblind? Are they red, green, colorblind? Are they completely colorblind? You know, mm-hmm. what, what's their vision compared to us from, from a human perspective? Is it 2020? Is it 2040, 2060? I mean, it's really kind of all over the map in the animal kingdom and trying to pin that down and, and figure out how to apply that to uh to camo design has has been a a, a huge pursuit of mine yeah joe is does anybody know for sure exactly what a a deer sees or is it still debatable (laughs) the 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 first human uh deer head transplant hasn't quite you know (laughs) not there yet but uh but they're working on it right i'm (laughs) somewhere in in russia or china or i don't know yeah (laughs) <laughs> Peace to all my my friends out there. Really, no nothing against you, but um, you know, it's there's there's actually um, there's some really great research going on in this field right now. I'm actually working with one of the research scientists that's pretty well known for it. But um, the the research is is really applied research. They they keep putting different colors and shapes and 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 different types of things. I'm not going to go too deep into it, but in front of white-tailed deer specifically um, and trying to gauge what they can perceive. And so they're getting a pretty darn good idea of, about what these animals see and perceive. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So is that, I mean, I haven't looked into it much, but I'm kind of making the assumption, correct me if I'm wrong, you can present, you know, this is obviously very much simplifying things, but present an animal with some sort of, you know, visual clue, a color or what have you, and are they just basically monitoring brain activity to see if the brain's sort of responding to that, meaning it's I, picking I, it up? You know, I'm actually not 100% sure if they're if they're pinging into the brain. They're definitely uh, observing uh, behavior. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're, they're taking a lot of their cues from behavior. They very well may have attached electrodes to their, their heads and, you know, shaved their little fur off and, yeah. you know, stuck it on there and seen what they can see. Um, no pun intended, but you know, that was a really bad joke. Um, (laughs) (laughs) but you know, as, as far as I know, most of their, their research has been behavioral based. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So let's, uh, one thing that surprised me when we were talking the other day is, you know, we were talking about species and some of the animals that our listeners might hunt. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of throwing them all under the umbrella of ungulates and thinking that it was all probably pretty similar. And you actually mentioned that among some of the species I mentioned that there was some differences in what they can perceive, at least that we think we know of. Um, yeah. Research is indicating that there, there, is, there are some, some interesting differences. Yeah. So I think one of the most um, probably studied 
I would assume would be deer. And then, you know, we have a lot of guys listening who um, hunt deer, especially mule deer, and then some white tails, some black tails as well. Can you just kind of tell us some of the differences between um, deer and human vision uh, as the research states it? Yeah, um, absolutely. So white tail, white tail, uh, mule deer, and even black tail uh, are they they see things very similarly. Um, they are red green color blind, and their vision, just the the clarity of their vision uh, alone, is close to twenty sixty. Uh, that may vary a little bit, but it's actually pretty darn bad. Um, so motion and big shapes um, really set them off. Uh, being red green colorblind, that's obviously why things like the super blaze orange stuff looks like tan to them, as well as uh, some of the hot pink camo that you see on the market um, is arguably more effective um, than the blaze. Uh, not that I'm a huge advocate for, for all of that stuff unless, you know, state requires it, but, Mm -hmm. um, that, that, that's, that's the explanation why that stuff can work. Um, but you know, when you look at you, when you go outside of that, uh, even a little bit further related to, uh, those three, I guess, little branches of the deer tree, you've got, you know, caribou, you've got elk, you've got, you know, you name it, anything that, um, uh, moose even, uh, are, are in along the lines of that same type of ability to perceive their, their world around them. Now, behavioral traits that they build up, uh, I don't want to get too, t- you know, down the, down the road with the tangent, but behavioral traits, uh, differ obviously from subspecies to subspecies. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, for the most part, they all have, uh, no UV filter in their eyes. They're all red, green, color blind, and they have crappy vision. <laughs> <laughs> Which that is probably crap, yeah, the crappy ahead. vision thing surprises me. I would have thought it'd be twenty twenty year. I mean, an antelope is. I wonder if they fall into that same category. I haven't gotten into antelope, but that's part of my research project that I'm working on right now. That's that's definitely something I'm diving into just so I can wrap my head around it. Um, I'm getting there. I'll touch uh-huh. back like early next year. And uh, <laughs> more data on that. Yeah. So I guess you mentioned two things um, along with that. Their vision's pretty bad. So probably think of details and that they maybe can't see details well. But you mentioned two things. One is movement, which is obviously um, a dead giveaway. And mm-hmm. then big blobs. And so two things on that. One is a lot of guys will say, oh, well, camouflage doesn't actually matter as long as you're still. Um, why is that not true? And in what circumstances might that not be true? Well, um, in the circumstances where that is true, I'll go ahead and, and argue for that. I'll be the devil's advocate because I know plenty of people that have killed a deer in, you know, running shoes, sweatpants, and a Carhartt jacket, and they just happen to stumble into this animal, right. you know. Um, but where camouflage can really come into play and make a discernible difference is where you're working against that animal's perception and destroying any chance whatsoever that they can pick out your shape, your blob from the world around it. Okay. So obviously you have to have hunting skills. You can't be doing jumping jacks out there, you know, and, and let the wind blow your scent into the animal. It's, it, it never works. Um, I've almost tried that, but the, uh, the, 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 where it really with with un, with ungulates in, in in particular, the the real, I guess, the real the real important aspect is to break up that outline of your body because they're going to know that because of the symmetry in the human form they're going to know that something is not right and it's going to you know they may they may identify you a lot faster if they can pick out your outline and right. some camos, some camos hurt you. Some camos help you in that regard. Okay. Yeah. So it's really a matter of you're obviously not invisible, um, with effective camouflage, but it's more of a, almost a confusion factor, meaning they might see something, but they're not going to be triggered to see, Oh, that's a human or that's a human outline and have their alarm response at least as quickly. So it's a little bit of a confusion factor. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, it's pretty close to invisible, depending on some of the patterns. 
I mean, okay. if if the colors and the breakup are right in the environment, you will you'll dissolve into your surroundings, and they won't pick up on you if you're not moving, and they don't smell you at all. Yeah. This is jumping jumping around and jumping back to something that you said earlier, but something I wanted to again personally just kind of know. You mentioned that they're primarily red green colorblind, right, deer? Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. So is green not very necessary then in camouflage patterns and <laughs> a lot <laughs> of all the do, giant man. a lot of the giant uh camos are built around green? <laughs> is that unnecessary? That's totally unnecessary if all you're doing is is hunting animals that are red green colorblind. Absolutely. Meaning deer included? Oh yeah. So 90 probably plus percent of whitetail hunters wear a green based pattern would be. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, that's that's for them. That's so they think it looks cool. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Interesting. So what do do they just see if they're red green color blind do they just see a shade of gray? No, they're extremely sensitive to uh shades of blue. They see yellow. Um and they, I mean, obviously they see all the different variations and combinations thereof, uh, not specifically green. Uh, leaves will look very yellow to them. The sky is, is deeper blue. I mean, this is, I mean, we're all guessing here. Right, right. But uh, they also, um, they're also really sensitive to, to uh, infrared. So things will start to glow in certain times of the day. Uh, things like if you're wearing a camo that has a lot of gray in it, Good luck. Don't move at all. Don't breathe. Don't even nothing. Because that the the lighter the shade of gray, the closer blue it is, the more it's going to reflect blue in the the, the environment, uh, and it's going to really they'll be able to perceive that pretty. I mean, pretty easily. Hmm. And at the times of day where they're more susceptible uh, to to that type of you know detection is you know in low light situations where they're they're really kind of relying on that. Uh, infrared spectrum. Hmm. That's why they're always out super late and super early, just yeah. hanging out. You know, because they they can they can see down into the IR spectrum. It's really fascinating. Humans that can't is... do that because we have a filter in our eye that blocks all that stuff out. Yeah, that is fascinating. So I I'm... get mine removed. I want to see it. You, know? <laughs> <laughs> you can be the guinea pig. <laughs> uh, so the the greens and reds that they just show up to them is is possibly yellow or blue or just some other color. Yeah, it's it's more of like reds come up more of like a tan. Blue greens come up more as like a. It's usually just kind of browns and tans. I mean, okay, brown, brown gotcha. being kind of a stretch because yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. That's interesting. Yep. So, so in addition to color, um, one thing I think is fascinating, especially with this whole concept of being a blob or a giant outline versus being mm-hmm. have your outline disrupted. Talk about what you've done and some of the patterns that you've developed to make an effective pattern that works um, at a variety of ranges, a close distance and a further distance, and maybe talk about how um, depth perception is for these animals. Yeah, sure. Um, if you're, I mean, still on, uh, still on the bandwagon of deer and, and related species. Um, so that include elk and that mainly since they're on yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Um, their depth perception is since their eyes are on opposite sides of their head, their depth perception is not, it's definitely not the same, um, as, as ours. Um, it, I, man, that would be so weird to be able to see a hundred, you know, 180 degrees or like almost, almost 360 that those animals are crazy. Yeah. But, uh, but, uh, you know, when they focus on you or they focus on something, then they can, they can actually have, you know, pretty good depth perception. Um, but, uh, birds, like if you're hunting birds, um, the reason why birds are always, you know, looking back and forth with their head is because they're trying to get a better idea of how far away whatever they're looking at truly is because they can't just look at it like a predator because predator animals always have their eyes closer together and, and are very good at gauging depth and distance. But, uh, birds, you know, most birds, not so much. Um, so when I'm, when I'm designing patterns for this type of stuff, um, I have to think about, you know, what's, what's number one, what are the animals that, you know, the end user are going to be pursuing, assuming that they're not going after other humans. 
Um, that's a whole different ball game. But uh, what are the animals? What's the environment? Is it does it need to be transitional? And is it going to be for bow hunting? Is it going to be longer range? You know, like rifles, whatever it may be. I have to think about that stuff because the farther away you get, really, the more breakup you need, uh, macro breakup, to to keep your shape uh, from isoluminating or turning into just one color because the farther away you get, it all just kind of turns into one color, Mm -hmm. um, which is why a lot of camo patterns just make you look like a brown bear, (laughs) just a really skinny brown bear tap dancing through the woods. I I always joked about the black blob back in the day of, you know, guys wearing (laughs) certain patterns that just at a hundred yards, it was, they might as well be in, be wearing black. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's the nail on the head. But uh, yeah, a couple a couple uh, camo principles that I'm really kind of shocked that that a lot of a lot of companies don't try and follow are just real basic stuff like you have macro shape disruption, which really distorts any perception of your outline. It destroys the symmetry, and then you've got micro or textural disruption, which the closer you get, the more it's going to blend you into your surroundings. Hmm. So just to, again, dumb that down, if you guys didn't catch that micro, you're saying small detail, essentially. Yeah, small detail. And then macro, you're talking about larger swatches of Mm -hmm. um, color or a pattern that would break up an outline. Absolutely. Yeah. Do you you have any idea what distance, as far as a deer, that one would take over? Is micro 10 yards and under or 50 yards and under? Um, for a deer specifically for that family, since their, their eyesight is so bad, you need to rely really heavily on macro micro. Gotcha. I mean, you, you, I mean, if you're a pet, maybe at a petting zoo, like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah you gotta be really close. Gotcha. Really, really, really close. Yeah. yeah. So okay. once again, a lot of the little details of, um, tiny sticks oh. or branches or leaves might not be incredibly effective then. Right. Most of the time, I mean, it, it's, you just can't perceive it. The deer can't can't really perceive it unless it, they're very very close. Yeah, that's interesting. It's it's interesting to see the approaches that different patterns take. I mean, something that Steve, you've worn a ton, and I've worn a fair amount as well. Is something like ASAT, and on the surface, mm-hmm. it doesn't have really micro disruption. Um, no. So you kind of wonder how much that does matter. Um, except for a really, really close encounter? Um, It depends on what you're hunting, really. Um, There are some patterns out there uh, that are more well-suited for some and just not well-suited for for others. I mean, (laughs) that's so nonspecific. (laughs) (laughs) I'm trying to to not piss anybody off. Sure. These guys going, we're going to get you, guy. Um, (laughs) Yeah. Bring it on. No, it's fine. Um, (laughs) Yeah. So like a lot of the patterns, most of the patterns that I design are all multi-purpose. You know, I want people to be able to throw them on and go out and have a large amount of success with just about any type of animal that they're, they're going after. Because if you're going to use, ideally you want one set of camo that's going to rule them all. You know, Mm -hmm. that's almost impossible, but, but uh, something along those lines where, Hey, I'm going to put, let's take first light fusion, for example. Um, I'm going to throw fusion on to go elk hunt. I'm going to go fusion on to go, you know, turkey hunt. It kills it. It just crushes it in both because it's, it has such a, a, a good blend of macro and micro. Mm-hmm. So it's really effective. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty awesome. I mean, I just to talk about fusion a little bit, it's probably how, um, most listeners might be familiar with your work as, as the designer of that and with the help of first light and, you know, wearing that this year, it's pretty amazing. I wore it actually last spring Turkey hunting. Uh, it was the first time I wore it and had some awesome encounters and then wearing it in the elk woods this fall, you know, there's those times where it was like me and my buddy, we'd separate, you know, for a calling sequence or something. Mm-hmm. And I'd try to silently work my way back to him and might be s- a total of like 70, 80 yards away and then try to find him from 70 or 80 yards away moving in the direction that I think he is. And it's almost like, where the heck is he? You know, (laughs) 
you have yeah. those moments and then when you see him it's like oh there you are but it is confusing yeah so what yeah it's yeah, what other principles um, apply to maybe fusion specifically or just, again, kind of the design philosophy of mm -hmm. the other patterns that you develop? What other, you know, one thing that interested me just looking at your site, um, math was mentioned in a few of the design elements. W what do you mean by that? I mean, how does math factor into um, mm -hmm. a camouflage design? I use the math. No, um, <laughs> it's uh, it's interesting I, when I was really kind of starting to dig into all of this, one thing I found when looking at nature is that you see a lot of fractal patterning, but it's not just straight fractal patterning. Fractal is, is basically kind of an algorithm that's ubiquitous throughout nature. It's kind of the way it builds itself when you, when you kind of dig into it. Uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, l look into it. You'll be amazed. It's, it's pretty crazy. Um, but one of the things that really kind of throws fractal, uh, fractals in nature for a loop is chaos. In nature and on the world, there's a lot of chaos in the environment. And that chaos really takes fractals and it, and it, and it kind of makes them not instantly recognizable as a fractal uh, in certain instances. So I found a way to incorporate um, the mathematical algorithms of fractals and chaos math into the way I build and distort shapes so that it forms itself the same way nature forms itself. Hmm. That sounds, it sounds really boring, but it looks cool. Well, I was going to say, it sounds <laughs> confusing and awesome and yeah, kind right. of boring. Yeah. <laughs> It, it's it's a hard thing to to put into like an elevator pitch. It yeah. really is. Yeah, I've worked on it and failed so hard. Right. Um, so but yeah, I mean, when you mentioned yeah, fractals, one thing that might help, you know, Steve and I and our listeners understand that. You mentioned that you know they exist in nature. Can you give us an example of what what you mean by what's a fractal pattern that might exist in nature? I mean, we're talking about shapes in a leaf or bar i yep. mean are we talking yep. about any of those elements or? i mean it's all over the place yeah i mean the way that that branches will form on a tree the way that the tree forms and the branches branch off of it um the way that um you know the the veins in a leaf are pattern the way that oh man it's i mean once you start looking and see it you're going to start seeing it in so many places uh there's a lot. There's some famous. Um, of course, now my brain is not on, uh, which is a bad time for it to not be on. But I mean, <laughs> I could Google it. I mean, Google fractals and check it out because there's a lot of really interesting, interesting stuff throughout nature where it's just you know it's all over the place. Sorry, I mean, it, it's it's. Uh, let me let me see if I can find something. Yeah. And you can edit all of this him and Han out. No. Yeah. Yeah. You're fine fractals yeah i'll give you like a pretty straight up you see it a lot in ferns pine cones uh you name it, like lightning everything is all fractals okay trees i mean i mean it's it's craziness so leaves i mean you're looking at those natural elements and then basically looking at natural design patterns, if you will, and then try and just sort of incorporate that into the patterns you're developing. Yeah. I mean, I was, I was looking at all of this stuff, stumbling into it. It was a slow, painful process, but stumbling into, you know, trying to figure out what makes nature shape, shaped the way it's shaped. And I, 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 I uh, figured out that it's fractals and, and chaos math put yeah. together. I mean, hmm. the chaos thing is interesting. I, I just, you said lightning and I pulled up a picture that happened to be sitting in front of me with fusion on it. And there's this just, you know, there's these different colors and blobs and there's just kind of this one streak in this one line and kind of looking at it as like, oh yeah, that looks like a lightning bolt. If you almost, if you almost play the weird um, game, <laughs> you know, where they, they're trying to analyze whether you're sane or not and then show you a blob. And say, what is it? Yeah, the ink blot test. Yeah, there's a little bit of that in some of the patterns that you've developed, but you can sort of see some natural elements for sure. 
Yeah, for sure. So when you did work with First Light, um, what are the some some of the other conscious design decisions that you guys made? Um, you know, obviously First Light, they knew what their market was in terms of most of the species that they wanted to target and then how we as hunters would be utilizing a pattern. So they come to you um, with a specific need for a pattern. Um, the process of working with them what are some of the specific design decisions that you incorporated into fusion when you developed it? Sure. Um, <clears throat> when we set out, uh, to start working on what's now called fusion, they really wanted to have a pattern that worked at any range, any distance, um, just about anywhere in the country. And easy, <laughs> right? A big gulp. Yeah, it took a big bump and I was like, sure, no problem. And, uh, you know, then I'm like sweating bullets trying to figure out how I'm going to pull it off. But um, one of the big things that the guys at First Light are, are very keenly into is making sure that macro disruption is going to be a key element of any pattern that they develop. Macro disruption is what's going to serve time and time again with the bulk of what uh, their, their end users are hunting, mm -hmm. you know? So, uh, but then they also said, but it's got to work with various types of birds, waterfowl, duck, geese, whatever, you know, turkey. Um, so that's where the micro element came in. And so I, I really started playing with, uh, a different type of layer, multi-texture approach. So there's, there's uh, essentially a background, uh, and various different layers of disruption that work at different scales together and, you know, whatever it might be. Um, and then there was just something that it wasn't done. The pattern wasn't done. It, it had a lot of really cool elements in it and it was functionally pretty good, but it was missing something. And, um, I was prototyping different ideas for final layers and what might, what could give this thing like a signature look. And that's where, um, I kind of had a eureka moment and I created the light and dark, uh, cracklature layers that can act pretty much like anything like branches, like leaves, like it just depends on your surrounding, what it's going to look like. And those are the, I mean, if, if you're looking at the pattern, there's a, it's got a look to it. And it's really because of those two cracklature layers that are adorning it. Mm-hmm. And then it, it looks like even in certain spots, almost there's, uh, to dumb it down, it looks like some overspray from spray paint. Some, and, and I guess that's uh, an attempt to hit that micro confusion as well. Um, Those little elements. It, it, I'd have to look at the pattern and where you're talking about. But yeah. There's some, um, there's definitely, the, it's playing with depth, playing with shadowing, trying to create... Uh, a, a greater sense of, you know, what am I looking at? And I'm a bird and I can't really see very well uh, in terms of depth and, uh, you know, but what am I looking at? Am I, is, does that have depth? You know? Yeah. But uh, th those type of elements can help confuse the perception of depth in certain animals. Yeah. So this is a question about any pattern specifically or, um, you know, the strategy of a pattern, but I'm just, I've, I've wondered this several times with multiple patterns. When you design a camouflage pattern, um, this is, sounds like a dumb question, but you know, you have a pattern and you need, you know, the, obviously it's going to get printed in this case for apparel. Um, so in a large roll, let's say before it's cut and then sewn into a garment. Right. So it, when you design a pattern, how large, at what scale you design for before it i guess starts to repeat itself if that makes sense or is there some sort of something else going on where you can sort of continually generate this pattern in a non-repeating way um that's cool science cool math cool stuff that um is kind of Secret. not <laughs> we can't talk about it no it's it's kind of superfluous right now because of the way that garments are made Okay. Um, 
you could have a continuously generated pattern that you'll never have anything that's the same ever. Um, and it doesn't matter, <laughs> mm-hmm. unfortunately, in most, in most instances, because it's getting hacked up into little pieces and sewn together. Right. So it doesn't mm-hmm. really matter. Um, but, uh, yeah, um, the sweet spot is around 25 inches. Okay. Um, any more than that. I mean, it's cool. You could go, I, I think that you could probably go up to like 55 inches, depending on your, your, the, the fabric. Mm-hmm. Um, and how wide the roll is, you could, you could make a pattern that, that is that wide. Um, but it's, there's not a whole lot of gain, um, for that. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's nice to have a neat and tidy pattern that crushes it and it's 25 inches by 25 inches. Yeah. That's just, dece- I'm surprised to hear that though. That's deceiving. Cause I can look at, you know, multiple garments of fusion, for example, and I don't feel like I'm seeing a repetition of obviously different 25 inch squares for sure. Right. That's pretty interesting. Yeah. Cool. So you mentioned, um, your research. Can you clue us in a little bit more to kind of what, what you're continuing to study and how that's going to affect future developments for Vale? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I can't really go too far into, the details of of who and how and all of that stuff yet, but I can say that um, I am developing a comprehensive guide uh, for specifically at first hunters detailing the the vision, the, uh, the ever, all the all basically bullet pointed, easily digestible bits of information that's going to affect the hunter uh, based on you know vision what they see, how they perceive it, and then different types of behavioral traits to be aware of, of the, the biggest chunk of the most hunted animals that I can put together. Mm-hmm. And just so hunters can be more informed and make better informed decisions. And I was thinking also it, it might be applicable to people that are just outdoor lovers and like to go out there and say, you know, they come upon a black bear or something. They're like, don't move. Its vision is based on movement. No, don't do it. You know, yeah. but, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, we're we're working we're working on that right now. Uh, it's really exciting. It's coming together. It's going to be available at some point um, in installments starting next year, uh, going through the different species and um, and it'll be you know it'll it'll all be free for everybody to just jump in and and learn and and get whatever they can get out of it. That's awesome. Hmm. So, cool. but, like, so I don't forget to ask, how can um, you know our audience stay up to date with that and receive that when it is available? Can they, and do you have like a newsletter or just follow you on social media? What's kind of the best way to stay up to date so we make sure and get that when it's released? Um, we're on Facebook. Um, I would just say, you know, jump on board, like the page. Okay. Uh, that's probably the, 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 the quickest way to stay up to date with what we're up to. Unfortunately, there's a lot of things in the pipeline that we can't share um, some really cool stuff, but is that's going to be the place where we announce it first. Uh, and then of course, concurrently on the website as well. I don't have a newsletter yet. I'll probably get around to it, um, yeah. but I'm putting more time into developing patterns that I am <laughs> sure. the newsletter right now. I, I should be, uh, maybe I, yeah, I hey, should that's a good that thing. at some point. Yeah. That's a good thing that you're in the trenches doing the real work and not messing with all the other stuff. Yeah. Well, if you build it, sometimes they come, but if they don't know about it, you know, yeah. maybe they won't. <laughs> maybe they will. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you mentioned bear, and I kind of wanted to ask maybe about a you know a non ungulate animal that uh, our listeners might be hunting. Have you researched bear vision at all, or know much about how that might differ from the red green color blindness or death perception or anything else of deer? Uh, I'm assembling that stuff now, actually. Yeah. Okay. Um, I know they see much better. Yeah. I know they're, they're, they, they see much better. Uh, their, their noses are extremely sensitive too. I mean, they're, they have all of the, I mean, it's like a, it's a, it's a predator animal, you know, mm-hmm. they're, they're good at, at, uh, stalking and, and killing and eating. Yeah. So, um, that's, I make really excited to get my hands on that data. Yeah. That is cool. So what a, you know, you're again, going back to the beginning, your military background. And then I know that you have worked on some tactical patterns. Um, in what ways do 
a, does a pattern that you develop for hunting and a tactical application, what do they share in common and kind of where do they differ just as an overview? Absolutely. Um, a lot of the, a lot of the differences are going to start with, um, with who the end user is. Um, like right now I'm working with uh, a, a foreign special forces group trying to pin down some uh, alterations on the stalker pattern on my website. And that's just the start. As soon as I get that spectrum, uh, the, the color spectrum and, and the little finer details keyed in um, as a transitional pattern, it's still got to be, then we have to think about you know, near infrared detection and nighttime operations. So then as soon as it goes to that special forces or higher end military tactical, um, level, it's, it's, it's complicated in a different way. Um, but in terms of how those, those patterns may translate back and forth, a lot of the same principles, uh, for hunting predator animals, um, will apply to humans as well. You, the same things apply. You've got to break up the shape and you've got to dissolve into your surroundings effectively. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So one question beyond camouflage, Mm. do you have any tips for, um, obviously beyond camouflage and beyond just moving like an idiot. Do you have any tips (laughs) for how hunters can effectively, um, conceal themselves or, you know, any tactics that they can do to help remain out of sight from the animals that they're hunting? Well, I mean, it depends on your environment. Yeah. You know, if, if you're in a really open environment, you've got to, you really got to hunt the wind or have really great range and still hunt the wind and yeah. hope. Uh, I mean, it's, it's really just kind of common sense, basic hunting stuff. Right. When you're, when you're in an area, say like I'm in, I'm in the Hudson Valley in New York and it's all trees all the time, every day, forever and ever. Amen. There's lots <laughs> of trees here. And so there's a lot of opportunities to use cover. Um, because any camouflage you're going to wear is going to be a little bit more effective if you can incorporate it directly into some sort of even light cover is going to mm-hmm. make it infinitely more, more, uh, uh more effective. And with some patterns, that's saying a whole lot, like fusion or whatever. Um, you can be, you know, up against a tree in, in a, in a stand in fusion. And, you know, like a couple weekends ago, um, I, I had, you know, (laughs) I had deer looking right through me, Mm -hmm. you know, because I was a, I was a dork and I, you know, made some sound or my, my, my release on my bow squeaked or something. And, and which it did and I wasn't pleased about, but you know, the deer looked right at me and it was, you know, literally 10 feet away from me yeah. and it's just looking right through you. So it, you know, you said away from camouflage, but yeah, you know, camouflage is going to make a huge difference whether yeah. you're in a, a close environment or even an open environment. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> did you have any other questions, Steve? Um, well, on, on the infrared side, what's, going on there in terms of like with animals or humans animals <laughs> it's pretty interesting um ungulates since they don't have the infrared filter in their eyes um are are sensitive to uh the infrared spectrum and okay. low light situations and what will happen is if you're wearing straight gray like there's some patterns on the market that have a lot of gray in them Mm -hmm. Um, those will start to glow blue. They will, or glow some sort of like if, if that's the closest approximation I can figure out in terms of human and a human equivalent is once, once that sun starts to go down their their eyes are going to pick up more and more IR. Okay. And And that's that those type of patterns will start to glow a little bit and see more and more blue. Gotcha. So as, Infrared and a deer, like essentially, like putting infrared goggles on. Yeah, not kind of, not really. Kind of not, not really. really. Interesting. Kind of not really. Okay, we use the the cordura we use in our packs is uh, it's a military product, a solution mm-hmm. dyed IR treated, and I always yep. wondered if there was some application for that, if if there was any benefit for that as a hunting pack, if if that was affecting the deer's vision or not. Uh, yeah, if, if you're in really low light situations 
and you know it's still cool and legal to do it um it can make a difference it really can i mean it also i mean it also depends on the pattern like i'm assuming mm-hmm. that that's multicam that you're talking about right yeah multicam and we have a couple solid just like coyote brown and foliage colors sure. yeah. so yeah not to interrupt but just to go back to something steve when you say it's ir treated you mean to prevent infrared um i i guess i've never researched into it my impression was because it's a military based thing that if if somebody's staring at that pack at night with infrared goggles on that it wouldn't show the same colors as as if it wasn't infrared treated gotcha okay right it won't light up as much like a christmas tree okay yeah Yeah, and different it gets squirrely when it when it comes to you know different different dyes on those camouflage patterns will reflect differently so Mm -hmm. within the pattern you'll actually you know it, it when you get to that level it takes a lot of testing and a lot of trial and error to make sure that you're your dyes and, and, and the whole process is really, you've got it down pat. So you're not currently or not yet a manufacturer um, of products. You're, you know, designing patterns, but what you just mentioned about dyes. Um, so are you basically saying that you could effectively print a color? I mean, you mentioned that gray might be um, respond more as infrared to ungulates, but there might be different ways even to print that based upon the dye where one might be, have a higher IR signal and one might have a less IR signal? Yes. <laughs> Easy answer is yes. You know yeah. what? Um, there's there's uh, some really good research done also into merino wool and how it absorbs IR. So it doesn't shine. In uh, interesting. Light. interesting. Yeah. So merino is a really great, a really great medium for hunting apparel uh, and even military. There's some military like some some sort of like special forces delta delta force private you know private contractors that uh do incorporate merino in certain situations hmm. that's really interesting just opens up a whole can of worms <laughs> so does. many worms yeah <laughs> it really does and it gets so boring so fast <laughs> yeah i doubt that i think you could just start start reading for days and yeah it's, just, yeah. it's all intriguing it's, stuff it's it's there's a lot of information out there about it. It's pretty interesting. But yeah, to answer your question, Mark, I'm not a uh, I'm not a manufacturer yet. I do I'm linked up with a couple different manufacturers, so I can actually do um, private label manufacturing for you know whoever wants to do it. It's just a matter of you know making sure that all the pieces are in in the right place and all the funding is there. Sure. Um, m- my business model really for the most part is camouflage development and and licensing and making sure it's getting out there to the brands that that really have the same ethos and the same mindset of creating top level product for end users that are really going to take advantage of 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 the the features that it that it has built into it yeah that's awesome so companies (laughs) like first light (laughs) bingo yeah Yeah. those guys are awesome i love them yeah well so again i'm this is above my pair gear. Once we start getting to IR and things like that, and you, I know you mentioned that deer don't have a UV filter. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. So, what's the difference between IR and UV? Um, you for know, a I, layman I, I, like I'm, me, I'm saying, you know what, I've been saying IR, and what I really meant to say was UV. Okay. My, I, I was saying it. You, I'm so glad you said that because it really is. I've been saying IR. And it's UV. It's ultraviolet. My brain was just sw- turned around there, and I don't know why. But okay. um, to go ahead and amend care. that, yeah. Sorry. That's yeah. <laughs> wow. Well, Let's now just it's go clear. on. Now it's super clear. Um, <laughs> this is what happens when you stay up until midnight working on the finest details of different shades of green. Um, <laughs> I'm not even joking. Uh, but yeah, so. Hey, it must they, not have been for a deer hunting pattern if it was... It actually was not. It was for the Special Forces guys. I was going to say, if it was over a shade of green, you'd just be like, ah, screw it. It doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, right? Uh, just pull it out of there. Make it brown or something. Yeah. Now, um, no, they, they don't have the UV filter in their eyes. Because um, okay. what uh, I was getting at, that whole conversation made me think of, and this is one of those things that, you know, I, I'm not picking on whitetail hunters. I am one, you know, among other things, but whitetail hunters have the biggest market and therefore they have the most products on the market. Therefore they have the most ridiculous products on the market. And so sometimes I question, you know, what's legit and what's not, but I know that some washing detergents marketed Mm. at hunters are not only sent free, but they talk about having 
you no, blockers right. or yeah. yep. so i was wondering if yeah. that was in your opinion i don't know if you've researched it but it seems like that could be legitimate then you know yeah you, a lot we don't of, know how effective it is but at least conceptually well, it's 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 all part of the it's all a link in the chain you know when if you're washing your stuff with with uv brighteners it's going to make certain things kind of glow in ultraviolet light and like i said i'm glad i'm not saying ir now oh man i'm never gonna (laughs) live that down i hope everybody who's making fun of me is having a good time of it um (laughs) but yeah so that's why it, it glows blue or violet you know um not red, not IR. Um, but yeah, so the UV brighteners in some detergents will actually make certain shades glow, and that's a problem. That's that's uh, that's no good. And you know, some some fabrics and some inks and so, stuff like that uh, are. Uh, I haven't gotten too deep into this. Um, it's all at the manufacturing level, but some of them are a little bit more uh, UV bright than others. Yeah, hmm. that's really interesting. Well, cool. Did you have any other questions, Steve or Joe? Do you have anything that you want to cover? Um, UV, not IR. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it's it's uh, it's great talking to you guys. Um, it's uh, it's it's awesome. I love the show. I'm glad to be a, glad to be on here talking about the stuff that you know we all pine over and care about and and, and obsessively pursue. Yeah, absolutely. Well, guys, once again, thanks for listening. Be sure to check out the show notes at exomountaingear.com forward slash 11. Have a good one. Thank you for listening to the Hunt Back Country podcast.